Oh, sorry, that was a very important phone call. And um, um, I'll, I had to restart completely. So this is in a new video. OK, I was just in plainly explaining what uh, the uh, matrix elements of uh, the system matrix are. So ALK is the integral over LL, K of x dx. So that's the length of, uh, for example, uh, L7 would be the length of this segment over here. So it's the length of the intersection of line L and pixel K. What we can take from this figure is that, um, at least if the number of pixels is large, um, that intersection is always, uh, almost always zero, and only if the line actually hits a pixel, it is non-zero. So you can easily see that the maximum number of pixels that are hit by the line is something like 2n. And typically, the line will hit n pixels. So it will have typically have n non-zeros in every row. Um, since the matrix size is n squared, something like n squared by n squared, a for at least for large n, uh, a is a sparse matrix. Now, uh, as a small side note, the uh, ALK can be computed very fast uh, by the algorithms of Zidon, as we call it in the radon or CT world, and more or less that's Bresenham for the computer science world. Uh, and more or less what you can do is you can just follow the line. So you uh, along this line, you look where actually the line hits the reconstruction area. That would be somewhere over here. And then you just follow the line and compute the length over here. And so in something like capital O of N uh, steps or with computation uh, complexity, uh, capital O of N, you can compute all the length of uh, the uh, intersections along this line. So this is very fast. And uh, that's the reason that this system matrix A, uh, this sparse matrix, is never stored, but uh, always computed on the fly. So whenever uh, uh, some um, element ALK is needed, it's not taken from memory, but it's just computed. OK, um, so um, what would be the typical size? Typically, a computer tomograph has a size of roughly 1,024 by 1,024. That's a typical size. Uh, so that's uh, around 10 to the 6 unknowns. And also, we have something like several times 10 to the 6 equations. So the matrix size is something like 10 to the 6 by 10 to the 6. Uh, and of course, uh, usually we have more equations than unknowns. So uh, we'd be looking for a least squares solution of the equation above. Now, uh, you wouldn't probably want to do Gaussian elimination for that. Uh, so you will li would like to use iterative methods and thus make use of the sparsity of the matrix. And what immediately comes into mind is something that we already looked at. It would be Landweber defined by fk plus 1 is i plus omega squared r transpose g minus r fk. And uh, we've analyzed this. We've looked at convergence properties. So everything's nice. And provided omega squared is small enough, then this is going to work. OK, um, the problem with this is that we have two applications of R in each single step, and that's very expensive. Think of uh, the fact that even though the matrix is, uh, is um, even though the matrix is sparse, it uh, still has a, a matrix size of 10 to the 6 by 10 to the 6. So um, just applying R once or the adjoint of R is going to be extremely expensive. Um, now, and something that's really troublesome might be um, the, the more equations we have, the more difficult it will be to actually um, execute this over here. And this is something which which you wouldn't like, which which is strange, because when um, if you say we have more measurements, that should always be good. 
uh, and it should never be a problem. However, here it does. If I uh, get uh, 10 times the measurements, then things will get much more expensive um, and uh, not much, much slower. And uh, uh, it's not completely clear why that is. Um, now, think of the first steps. And uh, that means that we ver work very hard even in the first step. So just by taking the initial guess, which probably is always something like zero, just to get from F0 to F1, which would still be a very bad, uh, um, probably a very bad approximation to the, uh, to the solution. Um, already this one is very, very expensive, although the outcome is not, is not, is not very good. Um, no, so that would give rise to the idea that we could reduce resolution and equations in the beginning and have something like multi-resolution. Uh, we, we start with a few equations and bad resolution, get a first, uh, get a bit, little bit better approximation by not working too hard, and uh, then use that in uh, for uh, imp and then improve that resolution in, uh, in later steps. Um, that is a very well known concept, uh, but it has some problems with uh, ill conditioned matrices. So we are not following this, but uh, we have an approach that is even much simpler. Okay, um, so um, in the uh, exa in our example, um, let me give you an example for parallel sampling. And I already warn you that I will be redefining GK over here, so it will be different from the GK which I had in the beginning. Okay, uh, let's assume a semi-discrete case to start with. So uh, let's assume that g of theta k and s is measured for some direction. So it's measured for k from 0 to p minus 1. Now, um, if it's measured, then we are looking for a function f uh, that satisfies rk f of s uh, is gk of s, where rk f of s is just the measurements in direction ck that would be measured if f was the true um, the true function and g k of s are just the uh, the, um, the measurements that the data that was actually measured uh, um, that was actually measured. So what we would like to solve uh, our f to solve is r k f equals g k for k from zero to p minus one. Same thing as before, only this time it's discretized in the angle. Okay, uh, note that uh, this is a very common structure. Uh, in many inverse problems, we have a source that's moving around and we get measurements for each single position. So uh, we typically get uh, um, a number of measurements GK for each single position of the source and uh, we have P positions. So we get something like this structure over here. So this is more is very often um, this is this is something that occurs very often. Okay, uh, now we have a very simple idea. Uh, we start with an initial guess f zero, and uh, to compute f one, uh, we just we want to just use the data that was measured at position zero. So we just want to use r zero to compute f one. For the, the for computing F2 from F1, we also don't use all the data and all the operators, but we only use R1 to compute uh, to uh, compute F2 from F1. And also in the p minus one step, of course, we just want to use R p minus one to get from F prime p minus one to F p. At this point, we've used all the data once, and uh, that's what we typically call a sweep. So uh, we, at this point, we've used all the data once. Um, after that, um, we uh, we start again with uh, with the, with the first data set. So get to get from fp to fp plus one. We start again with the data sets and the operators from the beginning. So you could think of this index over here as uh, just taking p modulo modulo p. So the index over here modulo p. 
Okay, so uh, in each single iteration step, um, first of all, we, uh, to, for example, to get from FL to FL plus one, we first choose one operator and one data set, and we look for um, an FL plus one that satisfies RK FL plus one is GK. We could do that. The problem with this is that uh, this is a 2D quantity and this is a 1D quantity. So this will be vastly underdetermined. This is a vastly underdetermined system. Okay, uh, no problem with that. We can take the minimum norm solution, at least if uh, we are in a discretized setting. Um, but um, probably we, wouldn't, we would like to somehow let this depend on FL. And um, I would like to define this in such a way that the difference to FL should be minimized. So the FL plus one should be chosen in such a way that it satisfies this equation and it's the one that's closest to, F, uh, to FL. And uh, it's already clear what that means. We need to choose FL as the FL plus one as the projection of FL onto this line. Okay, uh, we're writing this in the following way. Uh, FL plus one should be chosen as FL plus D, and we want that, R, uh, that FL plus D satisfies this equation. So we want that R RK FL plus D is GK, and D should be minimized in the Euclidean norm. And uh, that means we must choose D as the minimum norm solution. Okay, uh, putting RKFL on the other side, uh, then this becomes the, um, the linear equation, RKD is GK minus RKFL. The minimum norm solution of that is given by RK adjoint, RK, RK adjoint to the minus one, GK minus RKFL. Uh, that's only true if RK is surjective and uh, we will always assume that this is the case. Okay, um, so now we have a much simpler routine than before. In each single step of the iteration, we just use a very small equation, uh, very, small, very small system of equations. So that should be very much easier to solve. And uh, hopefully that's going to be a lot more simple and cheaper. Um, let me just quickly define this uh, in a reasonable definition. So we're calling this the Kutchmarts method or ART method, algebraic reconstruction technique method. The uh, task that we are trying to solve is, uh, the task we are we're looking at is solve RKF equals GK for K from zero to P minus one. And you might think of this as a discrete, semi-discrete case, whatever. Um, RK in this case is an operator from some Hilbert space X to an Hilbert space Y. And uh, of course, for each of the operators, the destination space may be different. So that's an um, operator from X to YK. Both are Hilbert spaces. And we start off with an initial guess F0, which is in X. Now, uh, we look for a sequence of functions FL that converge to the solution of RKF equals G, to one solution of RKF, of, of RKF equals GK for all K. Now, to do that, uh, if we're given an FL, we first choose um, a data set, an equation, K um, for RKF is GK, we're um, dependent on L. So the simplest choice would be something like L mod P as I did it above. And uh, we define FL plus one as, as FL plus the D from above. So that's RK star RK, RK star to the minus one GK minus RK FL. And uh, um, I already uh, noticed this. Uh, this is nothing but the auto, auto orthogonal projection of FL onto RK star F equals GK. 
and uh, sometimes I think we sometimes write this as PKFL, but uh, if I do keep in mind that this is an affine projection over here. Um, what you usually do when you have this kind of uh, iteration techniques, you introduce an iteration parameter, and that's something we want to do here as well. So uh, fl plus 1 is fl plus omega times, that would be the, uh, the, uh, the uh, structure of the algorithm we'll be using from now on. And also we'll write this as uh, in, in obvious fashion as pk omega times fl. And again, that's an affine operator. Okay, um, what are some properties of the Kaczmarz algorithm? First of all, it's extremely simple, right? Um, we have a number of equations and instead of um, solving them all in one go, we're just taking equation after equation and solve them sim uh, solve them uh, by iterative. And we, we solve each one, we, we solve only the small equations and um, do that iteratively. Um, typically we have that uh, the time for one sweep, so uh, the for the nth operator, for the pth iterate, or uh, in uh, our sequence uh, is roughly equivalent to the time for one Landweber step. So by the time we could perform one Landweber step, we could perform p steps of these algorithms, and hopefully the, by this time the um, the um, approximation will be much better than doing just one Landweber step. Now the problem of this, of course, is up to now, everything is just hope, right? I mean, there's no convergence theorem at this point. Uh, this is a good idea, but the first question, okay, does that at all converge? We will show that it does, at least for some special cases. And uh, there's another thing. Um, I quickly went over this inversion over here. So um, RK, RK star to the minus one. Oh, if these are matrices, we might have to invert here and um, we'll have to do something about that. And that's also something we're going to do. <laughs>